Hey, I'm Scott. And I'm Chris. And this is Doxologic, where we help you think with your Bible. Well, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Doxologic. Scott, happy fall to you. Happy fall to you, Chris. <laughs> Thanks, man. It doesn't feel like fall yet. Agreed. It is in it's the mid so, 90s. It's hot, man. It's, it's still hot. It's Even n- when you feel the leaves or see the leaves falling, you're still feeling the summer. You just think they burned off. Right. You know, <laughs> it's not the sweetness <laughs> that's of That's an orange, cool. that's brown. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they just got on fire. They burned it. Uh, it is warm here in October uh, as we are uh, recording and uh, excited, though, about the fall. I love the fall. We were talking about October yep. and our. Uh, um, episodes this month are going to be um, timely for a certain reason, but what do you think of when you think of October? You asked this right before we started Halloween. recording. Well, my daughter's birthday. Oh, your daughter's first birthday. First and foremost. She'll be six. Oh, soon. okay. Crazy. My middle girl, uh, Mackenzie. And then, yes, Halloween, of course. <laughs> but we, are we talking about Halloween? <laughs> we're not talking about Halloween But we're today. talking about something very famous. Even more important. That happened on Halloween. Correct. 505 years ago. Yes, right. that's right. What are we talking about, Scott? We're talking about the Reformation. Yes, we are. We're going to do a little bit of uh, background on the Reformation. And uh, so it's going to be a little bit of a dense ride, but we think it's absolutely essential that every Christian has a, a running, functional understanding of what happened 505 years ago. And we'll get to the event itself on October 31st, that's 1517. Right. And so, right. by the way, if you want an alternative to trick-or-treat and such for your kids, as they, if, if they do, uh, go up to houses and do the whole thing, you could say, Happy Reformation Day! <laughs> like, that's what you can teach your cute little kiddos to say, and people will look at them like, what? Uh, what is what? But this is true. It's Happy Reformation Day. All right. Let's get into um, before. We're going to talk a lot about Martin Luther, Mm -hmm. but we want to go back in time even farther than his life and set the stage for us. Pre-Reformation, what's oftentimes called kind of the high Middle Ages. What was... um, what was brewing uh, before it was Luther that really took uh, took the ball and ran with it? Right. And just to give a framework for what we're talking about, Reformation is implying something needs to be reformed. And yep. so to go back to the high Middle Ages, see what was going on in the church, especially we're going to be focusing on the church in the West, gives us an understanding of why the Reformation was necessary, what led to it. And so there were three major issues during the high Middle Ages that kind of defined that period of time. The Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, the authority of the Pope, and the functional outworking of grace and works and that relationship therein. Okay. In fact, um, Donald Fairbairn wrote a book called Creeds and Confessions, and he said this about, we'll start with the Eucharist, that, quote, there was no single doctrine more important to medieval piety than the Eucharist. And he goes on to say that the most influential development in medieval Catholicism was the affirmation of this big word, transubstantiation. Now, what that means is that the elements, the bread and the wine, literally are are transformed. Mysteriously, but literally. Mysteriously, but literally, corporally. Become. um, Essentially, the body and blood of Jesus. Now, that theology was already being espoused earlier than the high uh, medieval Middle Ages, but it, st- it, ha- it got a name in the yeah. high Middle Ages. Transubstantiation. The uh, trans meaning like a, a change, change of the substance of exactly. what it is. That it, it truly, every word that you truly, essentially, mysteriously, literally, these words were... Um, very thoughtfully crafted, argued over in, in those periods. Like, yes. what does happen right. in the celebration of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper by the church? Things that that many people, uh, as they hear this, would be surprised to even know these things have been controversial. They sure have. Yes, um, they have. And in fact, they were part of the controversy when we dig it into the uh, Reformation eventually as well. But what about, let's focus on here, grace and works specifically. Um, you do have some work to try to, uh, you know, limit the authority of the Pope, and we'll speak about that. They're kind of tied together in a sense. Yeah, the grace and works piece, though. Yeah. So the grace and works piece is interesting because um, what the creeds, so the earlier creeds, uh, none of them had discussed justification by faith directly. Um, What the creeds didn't state was how salvation affected the believer, 
Okay, so so the creeds do state like salvation, like the theology of salvation. So let's get salvation right. That was the focus, not so much how it affected the believer. And so as we think about, by the time Luther was born, Martin Luther, there was a, deve- a series of developments that had crystallized Catholic views on justification, what makes us right with God, and good works into what scholars call the majority opinion in the late medieval period, okay? And so I don't want to nerd out too far on this, but I would say important to note that the Catholic Church didn't officially rule on justification until the Council of Trent in 1545 to 1563. But we'll come back to that. Let me give you the framework for okay. the majority opinion. Um The basic outline of this was that they still held to the belief that at birth, all children were born with original sin. And as such, they were unable to save themselves or please God. But over the course of the Middle Ages, it became typical to teach, listen to this, that original sin was dealt with in baptism, that the soul was washed and received, this is a big word because it's going to be two different two divergent paths, an infusion of grace that the soul was washed and received. Here's the word, an infusion of grace. And this is particularly related to infant baptism. Yes. That the the original sin, yes, but then within a matter of, I think, usually days or weeks. About, I think it was the seventh day they were okay. they had this practice. They would, they would baptize these yep. babies and they would receive an infusion of grace that effectively is like what we would think of as baptismal regeneration, mm-hmm. right? This was the idea that the Spirit draws the soul to Christ, washes away original sin and allowing the person's will to cooperate with grace. And this became another massive part of the controversy, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, The infusion. Tying that in. Infusion and cooperation are going together. And that's going to be the Catholic understanding that's going to develop with that clear of a pathway forward. Sorry to interrupt No, it's you. all good. Medieval Catholic theology, this is a, a generality, but it's what we get from historical record here. It taught that one entered by the grace of baptism and remained in the faith by grace and good works, right. which all of this blending together is, a, is setting the stage of what would become the Protestant Reformation. And the sense would become that this was an addition uh, to uh, the gospel. That yep. it, it is, it is God's grace, and the Catholics would, would at the of the time would say yes and write about grace, teach about grace. But it was an, a mixing or an adding to the necessity of works mm. uh, to um, really achieve to be saved. Finally, yep, you're right. Um, the the interesting uh, cooperation word that you put in there is the idea of um, I was describing it to you earlier. It's almost like uh, you get baptized and boom, your spiritual fire starts, right? Yep. But then you that grace that was put in you, call it the fire, now needs to be tended to in order to keep it, you know, flaming. Yep. So you're trying to keep that fire going and that's cooperating with grace. And then we'll talk about how, you know, there's ways to throw water on that fire, which would be like you sinning. And yep. there's also a way to throw a spark back on your fire, which is penance. And so on and on, it continues to go. But, um, the, the Luther would later explain this and we'll dive into this, that, um, when it came to justification, since just the, 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 the grace of God was not infused into the Christian at baptism, but counted as the believers by, here's the other word, imputation. Yep. So now you're seeing this division between the Catholic view and the Protestant view, infusion, cooperate with grace, Catholic view, imputation, granted to the believer, credited to the believer's account I- by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so the idea is that it's given Gifted to the believer, the difference between infused and imputed. And, and that is the, the line, if you will, that was drawn in the sand. Yep. W- one of the primary ones, the imputation versus being infused with grace as a baby through infant baptism. Mm-hmm. So the stage being set around the Eucharist, around the authority and the extent of the authority for the Pope, around really what we would call the, the heart of the gospel, justification, being infused as a baby through baptism and then cooperating with God and grace mixed with good works. And so these things 
things did not just uh, happen uh, kind of in a vacuum, as they say. Yeah. It wasn't that Martin Luther stumbled onto the scene in the primarily early 1500s and, and like discovered this. These were problems, and there were more people seeking Reformation um, earlier than Luther, and even certainly during Luther's life and, and well beyond Luther. So while we are going to give a lot of history related to events around Martin Luther, who were a couple other... Um, key players that were around uh, in the same time period? Well, if you back up a little bit, there, and thank you for saying that, because there are so many uh, examples of this in history, but in the, which we kind of started with the high Middle Ages, you have uh, the Wycliffe uh, movement, or they were called the Lollards. Uh, you had the Waldensians, you had the Cathars, you had, the, they had differences in these movements, but what these movements, and admittedly, these movements in that, at that time period were very small, but if you were to read a book on the Reformation and what led up to the Reformation, you would hear about, you know, obviously we know the Wycliffe from the Wycliffe Bible translation, right? Still around. As Still an around. Organization. Right. Yep. After all of these and, years. And th that was punishable by death. Yes. At the they time. condemned him. As Translating a, from Latin yeah, to, into, the, the mo to English, to it, the... The language of the, the language country, of the people. The language yeah. of the people was punishable by death. Yeah, because it was Luther that translated uh, the scriptures into German, right. right? So anyway, the bottom line is that the Cathars, the Waldensians, the Wycliffe movement was driven by a desire to return to a simple biblical faith and leave behind the institutional church. And a huge part of that is because the authority of the Pope continued to grow and grow, eventually pushed out political influences because it was the, the, the Pope was most often controlled by the aristocracy in Rome or abroad by the Roman, the Holy Roman Emperor or Empire. And so you have this movement of guys that are going, let's get back to letting the authority be vested in the scriptures for our faith and practice alone. Let's make that the highest authority alone. And they were uh, condemned, as you said. And in the end, though these movements were small and largely inconsequential, they were leading to other greater people, you know, um, that would f come after after uh, those individuals. There's also Jan Hus yeah. and his influence uh, leading well, the Anabaptists. to Anabaptists, and then yeah, uh, yeah, and then we get into the modern movement. And so once the Reformation took you know root in the f about 1517 is where they where they yeah. land that plane because of Luther's 95 theses. But you had three kind of major players in the Reformation movement as we know it: the L the Lutherans, the Reformers, and the Anabaptists. And each of them had different, you know, doctrinal convictions, but they were pressing the same issue of returning to the authority of scripture yeah. and, and for different reasons had, you know, so you've got Ulrich Zwingli on the Swiss Reformation side, who would have probably been a lot more influential if he hadn't died early in the Reformation movement. He died in 1531, yeah. but he shared the the vision of, of the scriptures on justification by faith alone and rejection of Catholic practices. And, you know, they had some Lord's Supper issues. And then you had the Anabaptists. The rebaptizers. The rebaptizers called the radical reformers. And they had some problems for sure. Definitely. But they had the they had their finger on the pulse related to uh, baptismal regeneration being assumed by uh, particularly infant baptismal regeneration, as we would call it, practiced then by the Catholic Church. And they were saying, no, 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 you need to be baptized post your personal faith in Christ, emphasizing each person's faith in the Lord Jesus, repentance for their sin, and then after regeneration, acknowledging that, showing that in the waters of baptism. So they were the rebaptizers, and uh, they were extreme, uh, and they, uh, well, they participated in violence, but they also were great. They were dealt with extremely as uh, well. Persecuted themselves. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm going off of memory here, but the idea of uh, you want to be rebaptized, do you? Yeah, we'll throw they you would, in there. They would be drowned. Yep. They would be drowned, yep. and they that this is the way they got treated, and it was yeah. a radical time period. Right. <laughs> One that uh, I won't pretend, even as I read about it, to be able to fully probably grasp just what kind of commitment there was to some of these I mean, this is Baptist theology, granted, not not in every way, but Baptist theology today focuses on the same thing. That's their heritage. But man, where they came from. Yeah, right. So let's, we're, we're going to spend our time, I mean, because there are so many different trails that we could hunt down. Right. But for the sake of our time, 
we want to deal with Luther in particular. Uh, that's what you learn in school, right? You remember that? 95 Theses, yep. right? Uh, Luther nailed something to the church door. But we want to go back a little bit and give a background to Luther, his conversion, and what led to that fateful moment, October 31st, 1517, that frankly he never anticipated setting right. the fire or you know starting the fire that that started. Right. Right. So so we'll start when he was around 21 years old as a student at the University of Erfurt. I uh, hope I said that Ooh, correctly. Good pronunciation. Uh, Are you German? Erfurt? Yes, actually. German. Reiter. Chris oh, yes, Reiter. Right. This, <laughs> you love this story. My, my grandpa friend, yes, uh, who is like 88 years old now, uh, loves to talk about the Reiters. Reiter. Uh, the, we are German. It's like it's like Smith. Uh, so common in, in German. But I, yes, we digress here. Yes. So he's at the University of Erfurt. Uh, he was walking home from school one day. Yeah, this is uh, he's crazy. He's studying to become a lawyer. Um, walking home from school one day, he's caught in this epic lightning storm. Yep. Yep. Uh, no, I mean, there were probably a lot of storms, and so he, it's kind of like when the when the disciples freaked out about the storm in the lake. Uh, they were the professionals. They 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 knew the difference. When Luther knew the out, difference. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. freaking yeah. out. He probably knows what storms are like. He's convinced he's going to die. Lightning around him, and he cries out to Saint Anne uh, because he's he's trying to be a good Catholic. He's very common religious. Practice. Common practice. If you will save me, I will become I'm a monk. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what he declared. He made it through safely and true to his word, 15 days later, uh, he left uh, be, He left uh, law school to go and become a monk, just as he promised. His father <laughs> Tough. did not know until after the fact. Word wouldn't travel all that fast. Yep. He made Tough the decision. His dad. his dad finds out later and is just dismayed at what his son has chosen to do, but nonetheless, what's done is done. He gets a accepted in 15, uh, I believe that was 1508, and by 1509, uh, he had this relationship with Johannes von Stoppitz, uh, and, Stoppitz. and, and like he, was, he was allowed to begin teaching the Bible, and three years later, in 1512, at 28 years old, receives a degree in theology, uh, and von Stoppitz turned over the uh, chair of biblical theology to him, uh, mean, meaning he, he granted him this position, chair of biblical theology at the University of Wittenberg, which he held the rest of his life, Luther did, fascinatingly enough. And he started teaching the Bible before he actually got saved. Right. So he starts getting into, what did he teach? Romans. He taught Galatians. Psalms. He went through the Psalms yep. with his students, right? Um, about 1513 or so. Um, and it was these books that proved to be momentous in his conversion experience. Uh, and he was uh, guilt-ridden, his conscience just burdened by um, this amazing, brilliant, but disturbing, he called it phrase, the justice of God. And we actually have a quote here, and th this is what he remembers. He said, quote, I greatly long to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans, and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the justice of God, because I took it to mean that justice, whereby God is just and deals justly in punishing the unjust. My situation was that, Although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. Yet I clung to the dear Paul and had a great yearning to know what he meant." So he is, as, as you read that, you can tell he's just, like you said, I think, tormented by this justice. He's a justice of God. He is a uh, passionate, fiery individual. And and there was a um, one thing I was reading was making an analogy to uh, Paul, uh, well, formerly Saul, uh, uh, Saul of Tarsus, mm -hmm. and his zeal mm -hmm. for um, the Pharisaical religion, being a Hebrew of Hebrews, all these things, compared to the zeal that Martin Luther was showing as he studied the scriptures, clinging to Paul, trying to figure this out. And they were... Uh, of a certain kind of passion to find the truth. And then it finally dawns on him. And I'll read this next quote as he continues. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. 
Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Mm. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of scripture took on new meaning. And whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, Now it became to me an inexpressibly sweet and greater love. This passage of Paul became to me a gate of heaven. Mm. It's so good. That's massive. That's massive for his life. That's his conversion, his testimony to his conversion. Right. The justice of God. And then this, uh, this it is to behold God in faith that you should look upon his fatherly friendly heart in which there is no anger nor ungraciousness. He who sees God as angry does not see him rightly, but looks only on a curtain as if a dark cloud had been drawn across his face. Mm. Just to describe the change from uh, God as an angry God right. to God as a loving Heavenly Father. Right. And and that really is a sweet depiction that that all of us um, mm. who, who name the name of Christ, who know that we've been adopted uh, by faith as children of God, would do well to dwell upon. Mm. On a regular basis, can I line my own testimony up with um, with the words of Martin Luther here to say, God is becoming to me, has become to me, that loving Heavenly Father, em- embracing me as his own through the work of the Son, Jesus Christ, so that I know I belong to him and not this angry, uh, um, you know, vengeful father that Martin Luther saw him as. And I almost wonder, as an aside, just pastorally, listening to you say that, what a helpful thing to think about for someone who's struggling with anger towards God, to consider if they understand that, you know, justification by faith uh, concept that he was talking about, that the justice of God is the righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith Mm -hmm. alone and not in because when that hits you, you you sweetened to God, right? Mm-hmm. The gospel sweetens our heart to Him. So, mm-hmm. anyway, profound that He um, wrote as He did of that experience. But He would continue, and we're going to kind of get up to Him writing the ninety five theses. Right. And justification by faith alone is um, is is not the only struggle He's had with the Catholic Church, and uh, but it it strengthened, it intensified. He had issues with the Pope. He had issues with papal authority. He had issues with a number of other the practices of the Catholic Church. But we get to the 95 Theses. As his disdain for false teaching in the church grew, he was coming to see it as being prolific. And um, we got to give probably a little bit of background to what ultimately was a major catalyst in getting him to nail the 95 Theses right. on that Wittenberg door. Yeah, and that is the the work of indulgences or the uh, the practice of indulgences. So to understand some about what an indulgence was, it was a piece of paper, a certificate which guaranteed the purchaser that a certain amount of time in purgatory would be remitted, would be withdrawn as a result of what became a financial transaction action. You could do good works while you were alive that a priest would literally uh, remit or he would give you a piece of paper that was called an indulgence to say you, your faithful living, your good deeds are granting to you these indulgences that when you get into purgatory, which very, very briefly was that what well, yeah, is, is, we still, gotta address that. <laughs> is still the practice that when a Christian dies, they mm-hmm. do not immediately go to heaven, but they're in a state of what's called purgatory for an undefined find period of time for they would say, we don't know exactly. We don't know what the sins were, because uh, how many sins this person had for which they had not been purified. They had not confessed them. They had not sought penance or, or admitted them to a priest and had received the abs- absolution of their sins, specific sins. Mm-hmm. So purgatory is a spiritual holding place for the believer. They don't believe that non-Christians go there, but the believer would go there and you your soul would need to be cleansed. And there was a lot of mystery to it, but what they would eventually start to teach is that it could be the person's good works 
during their life that could shorten purgatory. But then the family could actually give to the church uh, in order to... They would give to the church, for example, we'll talk about this, to have a new church be built. Maybe they would donate generously, and a priest would then grant, in the name of that dead loved one, would grant a remittance, would grant a shorter purgatory sentence. Mm -hmm. A lot of mystery around this, but a lot of controversy for Martin Luther. Yeah, there was, and in fact, there was a there's a famous quote um, that came out of that what you're talking about, especially as it pertained to your loved ones and family members who had died. And we'll get to this person, but I'll I'll share it because of how you've set it up. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So yes, we we get and we are we are crystallizing into a certain moment here between Martin Luther and effectively a man named Dominican Tetzel, and Tetzel was in one town. He was one town over from Luther, and they were seeking uh, to was it were they seeking to rebuild Saint Peter's Basilica? The Pope wanted Saint Peter's Basilica. Okay. And so he They were fundraising yes, for it. Yes, they were fundraising and, and, and for it. And quite literally their fundraising effort was tied to the granting of indulgences. They called it a jubilee sale of indulgences. A jubilee yeah, sale. Yeah. Imagine what that advertisement must have been <laughs> like. Here ye, here ye, come get your indulgences for just a hundred dollars. And and we're, we make light of it, but this is what really was going on. The more, oh, yeah. more the more Martin Luther studied his studied the scriptures, the clearer this issue became mm -hmm. to him. That the mixing of grace race with works, and then the manipulation the of the people mm -hmm. by the Pope mm -hmm. and this man Tetzel, the manipulation was so severe, he got to the place where he could no longer handle it. And there was, again, there was one town of separation uh, from Tetzel to Luther. In Luther's town, I think he politically um, made the sale of indulgences illegal, but one town over, uh, and, and you're hearing that I can, if I give a few hundred bucks, the equivalent, um, I can I can release or help my loved one leave purgatory. His parishioners were leaving his town to right. go to Tetzel, and they were giving to the church, and in exchange, they would receive indulgences, and he had enough. Yeah, he, he did, and it was because, listen to how manipulative the whole thing was. It was so stinking manipulative, and just as we get to that, now he's he's revving to like write those 95 theses, and, and, and we'll talk about how that really played out, but a little background into the Catholic Church for just a second. Yeah, the yeah. practice of penance, that's a, that's a big Catholic word, and it's, it's what you do when you sin, Penance gets you back on the right track. You're okay. cooperating with grace again okay. as you execute penance, which could, you know, uh, unfold in a, in a variety of different ways, right? Uh, rituals that you do, um, uh, sacraments, um, giving alms to the poor, etc. But um, it wasn't fully defined in the church just all the different ways uh, to do that, and so the church knew that there was a problem with all this anxiety among lay Catholics. So imagine this idea that you know. Um, the requirement was merely one confession a year for your sin. Okay. And to so, a priest. To a priest. Okay. And so people, think about this for a second. You would need to be keeping track of all of your sin that you've committed for the whole year to make sure that you confess it to the priest. Well, that's a long list. And yeah. there's a good chance you might forget something. And for every sin that you forget... It, it accumulates in a certain amount of time in purgatory. And so this was the fear that they're dealing with. This is what they were trying to alleviate, not only of themselves, but also of their loved ones. And Luther had had enough. Right. And so he nails the 95 Theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. And 95 Theses is essentially 95 statements of argumentation. Yeah, it was it's, the uh, basis progressive of a, a debate, right? Progressive yeah, reasoning. Progressive reasoning from top to bottom, and one thing follows another. Uh, and and when you know, ultimately, it was common practice. He was not. 
you know, he didn't see himself doing something as momentous as it has now uh, uh, become in our minds when he nailed the 95 Theses on October 31st, 1517. He was essentially calling for a debate. He's a professional theologian, and by doing this publicly, uh, the, the, the church would be more or less in the middle of the city. So it was a public statement of, I call for a debate, ultimately about um, uh, these indulgence practices, but also about uh, the Pope and... And uh, if you read through the 95 Theses, they're really not uh, as sensational as some other things that Luther eventually said. He's pretty young at He this said point. some sensational things. He sure did. <laughs> and he did say some very uh, direct things yeah. about the Pope and, and about and the gospel and about, frankly, why doesn't the Pope use his money to build the church? Right. Uh, he's, he's the richest he's, among all of us. He's got more than enough. And why build this on the backs of the poor, basically? The gospel should be, should be central in every church, not indulgences. So he said some direct things things, but not, um, if you read them, they're, they're uh, pretty straightforward. A lot of people have commented on that. And a lot of the reason is this. He did not see himself as a reformer in the, wor- in the way we think of him now. He was trying to see the Catholic Church reformed. In 1517, as a professor of theology, what we, what we could say professor of Catholic theology, uh, because that was the church, he was trying to get them on track with the pure word of God. Mm-hmm. But a firestorm broke out. When you th- um, he wrote this in Latin, somebody that we don't know who took it and translated That's it right. into German and using it out. using the printing press, yep. which had been around something like 50 years at that point, this sucker just went throughout all of Germany in a matter of weeks. Where uh, We think of God's sovereign oh, hand man. over this and how the printing press was time and again used to uh, fan the flame of the Reformation and, and to send this around, uh, well, Germany and then beyond eventually. Very, uh, light speed compared to what it used to have been. And so without his even asking or trying, his name was, I mean, within reason, a household name. And the next four years became, um, he became a lightning rod. Oh, yeah. Martin Luther, that to say that name would elicit strong opposition or strong support just by saying his name. And we can think of other lightning rod names where just boom, you've got controversy, you have strong opinions, all of this. There were a few people in the middle uh, that wanted wanted to see, uh, you know, try to keep the peace and hold things together, but they weren't going to last long because this sucker was on a collision course, uh, and it just took a matter of a few years. Mm. And so Luther was asked to defend himself publicly and privately, and these opportunities to defend himself became the spur that drove Luther to reveal this deeper conflict with the church, and he refused to recant. And so in 1520, he was excommunicated and handed over to the emperor, Charles V, to be tried as a heretic, which, by the way, the papal authority thing, man, they threw heretic around anyone who disagreed. Eventually, they threw heretic um, around—they almost connected it that if you weren't in agreement to the Pope. I think it's the Unum Sanctum, which was a, a, a bill or a bull is what it was called, a statement of the Pope from like 1300s. It was like, if you weren't in agreement and submiss- submissive to the Pope, you couldn't even be considered a Christian. It yeah. was that strong. So right. they threw condemned, they threw heresy out, you were excommunicated. And, and and But anyway, so that was the language there. Kind of reminds me of a guy um, who said that uh, to question me is to question the science. Hmm. I don't, I don't. <laughs> Sorry, that was for free. That was what Dr. <laughs> Fauci once said. You know, to question him was to question the science. That's a 500 year old issue. To question the Pope was to question Christianity. Will they have if podcasts you don't go along in 500 with the Pope, years? You're not a Christian. I digress, let a little bit of my personal uh, life into that one. But anyways, back to Luther, pardon that interruption. We have got in 1520 and 1521, this brewing storm. And what was so interesting was that you have the, the conglomeration or the, the, the mashup of politics and religion, okay? There's a lot of talk about that these days as well, but it is nothing like it was then, right? In Italy, uh, the emperor and the pope and all the, the convergence of these things so that Luther ends up not actually actually being um, tried by church authorities, but he gets summoned after he be, he's excommunicated in January, he is summoned to uh, come before the emperor right. and his, uh, the leadership, the political leadership though, of right. the church. 
Right. I'm sorry, political leadership in Germany. Okay. Yes. So you've got you've got the Roman Catholic Church, you've got the German political authorities. They call him to what is oftentimes pronounced the diet of worms. But just watching so the calories <laughs> and only eating worms. <laughs> diet full of worms. Just so we're clear, the actual way to say yeah, it is. Yeah, come on, the, Ryder. The, <laughs> say, <laughs> say it for us, Ryder. The, the, the deet Ryder. of worms. The deet, the deet of, of worms. worms. So D E T, the deet. <laughs> uh, deet was a general assembly of the imperial <laughs> estates of the Holy Roman Empire. It was nothing uncommon, the deet. And then worms, W O R M S, but worms was just a German town. Mm -hmm. So it was the. General Assembly happening in a German town on the western bank of the Rhine River, and so uh, this is what um, this is where the the showdown happens. That is famous, called again the Diet of Worms, and um, as Luther's fame has spread, he has got one particular um, what's called Elector. The Elector of Saxony was like a governor; mm -hmm. it was like his governor over that part of Germany in which he lived. His name was Frederick the Wise, and we're not going to focus on him, but we're going to drop his name in there. First of all, to say, I would love that kind of name. That's awesome. Frederick the Wise. We can work on that for you. Thank you. Chris the Wise. He was the elector of Saxony. He was a, he was a Catholic, but he was staunchly um, pro-Luther in terms of defending the man's freedoms and liberties to write and to practice as he saw fit. And that, speaking of God's sovereignty, was, was a massive part of why Luther made it as long as he did in life. Right. And then in November of 1520, the emperor invited Luther to the Diet of Worms. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good. Which would occur almost six months later. And when you think about it, you think of it, it most of the time, this is how I heard it. It was, it came down to that one famous speech, right? So the whole Diet took place in one day, but that's not really true, is it? Right. It took place over multiple months. That's right. Because there was a process of hearing from Luther and, and calling him to recant and him being pressed again and again. And let's just be honest, there are moments of serious weariness of Martin Luther where you see his humanity yep. just hanging on by a thread in the midst of this unfolding. Yeah, yeah. The, not being something he asked for. Uh, by those 95 theses. That's right. not what he was looking for. Now it's been several years, though. He does now know, and and, and not to uh, full search not to be done now, but he knows far better what he's up against and what he's going to have to do because he knows he will not violate his conscience before God and his word. We'll get to that uh, you know, a future episode about how important that was, his conscience. But on April 18th, 1521, um, that is uh, among the most famous uh, days of the Dita Verms, and he was summoned and was um, asked two questions. Number one, do you acknowledge having written these 20 books lying over here? They had <laughs> stacked them out. They had the stacked side. them out, and that do you acknowledge or confess to have written these 20 books? And then, are you prepared to retract uh, the books as a whole or in part? And he was expecting more of a conversation. It had become a deliberate ultimatum to recant everything he had said. And I think the historians that have, have tracked Luther, and there's some good biographies, and maybe this is a time to, to just know a really good biography, is uh, Roland Bainton's B-A-I-N. T O N right. Roland Bainton's book Here I Stand, yep. based on that famous phrase that was uttered at the Deet of Worms, and um, but but his his weakness in this moment he he was overwhelmed. You ima I can't even imagine the pressure, mm -hmm. the political pressure. The, the he was going to be. Uh, removed from the community altogether. I mean, you think about the personal impact of what was going to be, oh, yeah. what was going to take place. So he asked for 24 hours to think through that second question. Are you prepared to retract as a whole or in part? Where, where are you at on recanting all of this? He sought prayer and counsel and was granted it. And on the next day, he delivered one of the most famous speeches in Christian history. And if you haven't heard it, we will give you a, a summary of that and, and quote it as much as it's been passed down in church history. I'll, I'll say this too. There, I don't know if it's on Amazon Prime still, but on, on 
yeah. at least a couple of popular streaming services, you can look up Martin Luther, Luther. and I find think it's on really YouTube, well done. Maybe it's YouTube. Yeah, it's good. Really well done, 90 or so minutes. Uh, it, not so much a documentary as a movie. I mean, mm-hmm. an acted out movie that yeah, they that. really capture this well and they capture this moment and the drama around it and, and very well. So if yes. we're not doing a good enough job for you, listener, <laughs> the movie would probably do a better job yeah. of showing you. I mean, his life was on the line. That There were people that wanted him dead, and they were willing to kill him. Mm-hmm. And or they were just hoping that these political leaders would see fit to put him to death. Yeah. I mean, th- there were there were a substantial number of people that would have been very pleased at that outcome. So the following day, Luther stands before this council, and he, he gives kind of a new launched answer regarding the 20 books. He says, first of all, there are there are books that are in that stack that are of a devotional nature, many of which even my theological opponents have appreciated and agreed with, okay? So I don't recant those. Secondly, there are some where I have attacked specific ecclesiastical, that is church abuses, and 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 I would say, uh, I, I don't want to, he, he was saying, he didn't want to recant those because that would be encouraging error and tyranny. But then he says, third, Thirdly, there's a number of writings that are directed against specific individuals, and there he would admit that his polemics, his way of writing was very harsh, and so there was that for which he would apologize. But Scott, what's his quote uh, at the end of this, His the end of his speech that's so well known? So the famous line that he um, allegedly said at uh, the Deet was this quote. I love this so much. This just fires me up. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recount, recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. And you've just got an, an eruption in the room at that point, right? His supporters cheering him on, his detractors and enemies at that time, opponents are so enraged that he would say such a thing. Uh, Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise is a disputed saying, whether or not it ever took place, but it's it, it's it's definitely... Um, it's of, it, you could hear him say it, oh, right? Yeah. It's within his character to say such a thing. And so it's attributed to him. Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. And and following his speech in which he ultimately does not recant, there were six electors, six governor types, one of which was Frederick the Wise. They begin debating what to do with Luther. Four of them, it was said, wanted to condemn him as a heretic. But Frederick the Wise and one other, voted against such a move, and so they could not move forward to condemn him. My understanding is that it needed to be unanimous, and so it was not unanimous until, again, this is happening over a weeks and weeks of time, Frederick and the other elector who were in Luther's corner head home back to their post where they were, uh, where, where they were, were representing, and a man named Aleander drafted an edict. The four remaining electors ratified that edict in which they condemned Luther. So fascinating politicization, waiting for the supporters to leave, and now they have a majority and they have unanimity, and so Luther ends up getting uh, getting condemned. Now, what's so fascinating about this, and you see again God's sovereign hand in this, that on Luther's trip home, Frederick the Wise had arranged Luther to be kidnapped to make it look like mm-hmm. his enemies uh, finally were going to off him, right? right. They, they were going to finally get rid of him. He's Murmuring con- about his death. He's condemned and he's not he, he's not welcome. Don't take him into your home. Right. Uh, do not give him the, 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 um, the position that he holds as a professor, all these things. He gets kidnapped. Luther knew it was going to happen. And, and Frederick the Wise set it up, and he actually gets hidden in a castle for months, mm-hmm. and that's where he translated the Bible into German. The rumors went around that he was dead, right. all sorts of stuff, and, and uh, Luther lives, though, um, another 25 years 
in various places, but he lives constantly under uh, the possibility of assassination. Uh, since he'd been declared an outlaw, he continues to write, though, just just uh, vociferously so many books that he translates, so many things he writes. The European nations around Germany are getting uh, his teachings through the printing press, uh, again, uh, in a sense, immediately. Within a matter of weeks and months, Luther is getting distributed um, far and wide. And then he dies in 1546, and we kind of wrap up the story to say, we're going to make a transition, and even in the next podcast, begin to really play out. What are the implications of Reformation then, and how does the Reformation, how ought the Reformation to affect us now? And it's no exaggeration. Kevin D. Young's a professor at Reformed Theological Seminary, and, and I'll make the transition like this to just kind of concluding with this enduring legacy. What can we learn from Luther's life and enduring commitment to Reformation? But here's what Kevin D. Young said to just give us some framework in this transition. He said this, quote, It's not an exaggeration to say that the history of the Reformation, the history of Germany, the history of Europe, the history of the church, and indeed the history of the world, were changed because Martin Luther refused to do and say what he knew in his head and heart to be wrong. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that uh, we're going to try to def- not so much defend that ourselves, but just to say— um, we can see that in history. We can see even I, I've uh, I, I'm teaching a theology class to um, middle school students, what we call our logic stage at Eden Classical Academy. The line that can be drawn from this time in Germany to ultimately England and the Church of England and to the Puritans and the Pilgrims that came to the New World it is pretty fascinating at a high level. Like that sort of impact politically, religiously is certainly still reverberating to this day. That's right. So what can we learn? So what, right. what, what are we, what are we going to learn? Number one, uh, when we think about Luther's enduring legacy, and this helps us really transition to our next uh, episode, but standing on the word of God. Make your life commitment to stand upon the word of God, to know the word of God, to love the word of God, to live the word of God, right? Yep. And be willing to oppose false teaching, even in the face of grave danger and overwhelming odds, that set Luther apart right. in many ways. And we need more reformers like that yeah. today. Yeah, amen. Uh, rejoicing in the free gift of God's righteousness, right? The free gift that God gives his grace to sinners. Romans chapter three, and we'll probably turn there in the next episode to show just the, the basis for which we have confidence before God is his free gift of grace received by faith so that sinners are made righteous before him of yes. no good works of their own, but the, uh, as I've heard it called, the empty hands of grace is all we have. I mean, empty hands of faith to receive that gift of grace from God was the the became the battle cry of uh, the Reformation. Imputed, not infused. Right. There it is again. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about this in the next episode. The, but the value of a clean conscience before God. Mm. Right. Not having these regrets that you wish you had stood up and said something. Wish you had held fast to the Word of God. Wish you had refuted those who contradicted God's Word. Not succumbing to the pressure to do otherwise, right? right. Um, living with a, what a gift yeah. a clear conscience is, right. right? Like you may not, and he, you even said that a Luther apologized because some of what he said was harsh. The truth is he, he said quite a few things right. that were harsh yeah. to make a point at certain times. Yeah. And he would walk that back as I'm sure all of us would want to do. But I think I'd rather die on the sword of, um, you know, needing to, to pull back at certain times mm-hmm. than wishing I had said more. Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt. And uh, there, there's a lot that we're going to be uh, ruminating upon and trying to deliver by way of application for uh, for you, our dear listeners, in the next uh, episode. We hope that this, though, has been a, a helpful historical foundation, maybe just some interesting uh, um, parts along the way that you did not know before to understand where uh, where we were before Luther in history, how Luther became such a, a, a lightning rod, such a pivotal part of the Reformation. 
information, as we've already said, not the only one by any stretch, but uh, by God's sovereign design, seeing Luther be used in this way to fan the flame of the Protestant Reformation, for which we are so thankful to inherit this heritage. And then we will look at ways we are uh, wanting to be a part of Reformation work still today, because there's a sense in which, for sure, the Reformation work never stops. We continue to reform. We want to reform to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be uh, assessing that and getting to more of a present day look at that today. Any last words, Scott? Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, same here. So thank you for giving us uh, the time today. We hope that if you uh, find value in this, that you would share this. We'd appreciate a rating. A five-star rating in the app store that you use is always greatly appreciated. And continue to share the word about Doxologic. We will see you next time. You've been listening to Doxologic, a podcast by Doxa Church in Rockland, California. To learn more, visit us online at doxa.church.